Uh, got that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. It, it, I'm sorry. You said Vice President Biden's here today? I don't know why. Actually, I, did you know that Justin Bieber came to the school? This was, I think, three years ago. He had a concert at the Toyota Center. Apparently, he really needs to use the bathroom. And he actually pulled his limb up front. He came in for like five minutes. That 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 actually ha I, I didn't see it. I, I've only heard about this, but that actually happened. You all seem so enthused about that. No, I, I don't know why he's here. Uh, but if he is here, you might experience a motorcade. Does anyone experience a motorcade? Do you know what that is? The worst. The worst part of living in Washington, D.C. are the freaking motorcades because they just block off streets for miles at a time. You sit there, park, and wait for a dignitary to come by. It's the most annoying thing in the world. I hope he doesn't block my traffic. So we go somewhere tonight. Uh, 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 anyway, I don't know where he is. Where you going? I'm going to Washington, so I guess we're switching places. I, I have a flight tonight, so hopefully we'll be, uh, we'll be swapping. Okay, let's see. Uh, is everyone saying warm? I see a lot of people wearing scarves and hats. Are you that cold? We, yeah, I, I, I love when they put like a frost advisor. It's like 40 degrees outside. Everyone starts panicking. Uh, uh, this, this is not cold. Yes, I have a jacket upstairs. I'll be going to Washington. It's going to be much colder there. Uh, but I will be. John, is John sound colder? This is nothing, right? Yeah. Do you even, does this even bother you? No, no, this is, this is fine. This is nothing. Okay. All right. So here's the, here's the deal, folks. We only have a couple classes left. We are, we are in the home stretch. It's, believe it or not, we're almost done. Um, our, our class on Monday, I told you, we're moving to Tuesday because uh, Justice Busby will be our guest lecturer. Um, I strongly encourage you to come prepare because Justice Buzzy's a really smart guy and he's doing the school a very good service by volunteering to come teach. He's done this before and he's very good. So there won't be class on Monday. Instead, it'll be a Tuesday uh, from 10.30 till noon. And I think that works for virtually all of you. Uh, and if it doesn't, send me an email. We'll, we'll figure something else out. Uh, but that will be the class. Uh, we won't be in this room. We'll be in room 314. Uh, please make a note, and if anyone's not here, please tell your friends so they don't show up on Monday, because I won't be here. Uh, you can sit and you can read your book, but I will not be here. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, uh, the readings for that class are two cases from the book, and one case, it's a Texas Supreme Court decision from 2012. Uh, Justice Busby helped argue that case before it was decided, so he'll have a, a very special insight into it, so if you want some... Uh, local perspectives on property law, be sure to take a look at the case. It involves beach erosion in Galveston and how property rights accrue when all this new sand is dumped in the Gulf. Okay, so our review session, it's going to be on November 25th. That's a Tuesday from 10 to 1. Okay? Uh, the first 90 minutes, I'm going to proctor uh, this question, which is my fall 2013 exam. Uh, question number one. Uh, you can link from it here, or you can link from it on the syllabus. I don't really you can get it from either place. Um, the way it works is the first 90 minutes, I'll proctor the exam. I'll give you a 10-minute break, go stretch, whatever, come back, and I'll go over the A-plus answer. Um, you can do the first question at home. You don't need to come here. If you want to come here at, like, you know, 1130 or so, you can do that but I encourage you to at least take under normal test circumstances. If you want to practice, go take a different question. Go, I, I've been teaching this class a number of times. If you go to the syllabus, you will see one, two, three, four. So basically eight full questions for you to work with. So go take a look at them. And also I have the model answer up so you can go check yourself, okay? Uh, what you'll find uh, for the review session, invariably, is that your answer will differ from the model answer. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. The most frustrating aspect of teaching this, and I'm warning you in advance, I know it's going to happen, is that you're going to jump up and say, Professor Blackman, what about this? No, Josh, what about that? I was like, that's a good point, and that's a good point. Uh, you'll see the way I write these questions is that they're fairly open-ended. There isn't one right answer. I write these deliberately open-ended so you can show me what you know. And there are lots of ways of getting to an A. Okay. Uh, I'll go over more about this later, but in general, don't hold yourself if you have something different than the model answer, that either the model answer is wrong or that you're wrong, because you very well may both be correct. 
And I'm warning about this now, but the review sessions always turn to be very hostile. This is why professors actually don't do them. A lot of professors don't do it like this because it has a lot of, lot of stuff coming at you. So try to keep it as calm as you can. But I've, I've done this before. It happens every single year. OK. Uh, and it'll be in room 316, so it won't be in this room. So you can sit wherever you want. I really don't care. All right, so any questions about the next two weeks? We're now on the 12th now. So basically, if my math is correct, basically two weeks from today, uh, we'll be doing our final review session, basically. We'll be done for this class. All right? Any questions? Anything on your minds? Anything bothering you? Anything plaguing you? Yeah? How much of If you take a look at the uh, sample question, you, you'll see, you'll answer that question. I think I might have asked about it last year. I don't think I asked that before. Uh, but the general answer is everything's game. If it's in the reading or I talk about it in class, it's fair game. Uh, the flip side to that is if it's not in the reading and I haven't talked about it, it's not fair game. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about something you've never seen before. Uh, I don't do that. The way I write my exam is I go through my lecture notes. Say, oh, we cover this, we cover this, we cover this. Oh, we skip that, we cover this, we cover this. Let's do this, right? That's my exam. There's not going to be any mystery meat, right? There's not going to be something you haven't. It's not going to be any random topics we didn't cover. Or just probably find reading. And is that you know, all the like websites that you have to read on your site? Yeah, I mean, if I, if I if I mention something in class or I discuss it, that that's fair game. And again, everything's open book, so you can bring whatever you want, print whatever you want. I don't care. You can't use electronic notes. I've gone through this before. Uh, uh, I always, I'd be inclined to let people use electronic notes, but people are too afraid about cheating, so I just I, I've disallowed it. Because when you have your laptop open for electronic notes, you can look at other stuff too. So print it out, kill some trees, uh, uh, make it warmer, hopefully, and uh, I think then we'll be okay. <laughs> A couple people got that. All right, what else? Anything else? All right, so let's get started. So our discussion today is continuing on takings. And takings refers broadly to instances where the government takes or assumes title to someone's property. And we discussed there's a couple ways that this can be done, right? The obvious one, the most obvious form of taking is what's called eminent domain. This is where the house says, okay, so the government says, okay, we want to take your house to build a park. Here, we're going to give you some money, and you give us a title, and you can't do anything about it, and we're going to bulldoze your house. Right? That is the easiest taking because it's physical. We see it. Someone's bulldozing your house. The rest of the takings are a lot harder to measure. They require instances where you have to keep your property, but stuff is done to your property to diminish its value. <coughs> so we did the first case. This is a Loretto case involving uh, the New York law that forces you to install a cable wire uh, running outside your building and a, and, a, and a box on your roof. And the court hailed there in a very bright line, oh, sorry, can't speak today, a bright line rule that any permanent physical occupation, that was the phrase, right? Loretto was the uh, permanent physical occupation, right? If there's a permanent physical occupation, that's a per se or categorical taking, right? What does it mean for something to be a, a categorical or per se taking? It means that there's no balancing, right? There's no balancing. It doesn't matter how large or small the occupation is. Even if the wire is only a few inches wide, that is sufficient to have a per se categorical taking. And when there's a per se categorical taking, you must pay compensation. Right? You, you must pay compensation. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, the compensation might not be much. In the case of the New York, they determined that $1 was sufficient to compensate the uh, apartment building owner for having to put this wire on her roof. Right? But this is a per se categorical taking. So the rule of thumb with this one, or maybe called a rule of nail, right? If something requires a hammer to install, it's a, it's a permanent physical <coughs> occupation, right? You're putting something there permanently. If there's something temporary, the example we gave was flooding. Say uh, the government blows up a dam and water comes in, then it drains out, right? That's only a temporary physical invasion. 
and that is that is transitory. That's that is temporary, so it doesn't last forever. Okay, so that was the first one we did. Then we did a case of had a check, right? Had a check. This is with the bricks. So the city of Los Angeles passed an ordinance saying uh, you cannot bake bricks in city limits. And the city said, this is because we worry about health and safety. We don't want all these noxious fumes and noise and all these other negative externalities that uh, result from brick baking, or whatever that is. So this basically took the value of the guy's brick lot and reduced it to zero. Before, it was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. They could make all these bricks. And then after this ordinance, it was worth zero because the only purpose the land was used for was making bricks. So the court there said that this is not a taking, right? This is a exercise of the police power for nuisance, right? That under the police power, the state has broad ability to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people. And this baking of the bricks is nothing more than a nuisance. And under the police power, they can do it. So even though the, the, the property value was diminished 100%, it was worth zero after this, the court upheld it as a nuisance and was not a taking. Just in that case, they were trying to like discuss the fact that uh, I guess they were trying to lean on on the fact that the need for the bricks <coughs> was like something high to be considered. Would there ever be, I guess, a factor or a way that that would balance in favor of uh, the plaintiff? Like, well, we're have a check is not the end of the line. So the case you're going to study on Monday or on Tuesday with Judge Busby updates how to check. So preview, and this is going to be the tricky part, right? How to check was like 1916 or something. It was a very early case. There were a couple cases in the 1990s that modified how to check. And I don't want to go there quite yet. Judge Busby will do a wonderful job teaching about that on Tuesday. Um, but, but no, for now, you may put a little note, asterisk, that these tests get modified. So we're going to leave how to check to the side. But for the minimum, we, we can call this maybe the nuisance theory of taking, right? This idea that if the government is simply shutting down a nuisance, they don't need to pay compensation. There's no taking of property. Because under the police power, they can pass such a regulation. All right, we're going to have a lot of these tests. Unfortunately, um, takings jurisprudence, takings case law by the Supreme Court is a freaking mess. And I don't say that uh, lightly. It's a mess. It's disjointed. The pieces don't really fit together well. And I will do my best to provide a synthesis or a clear map. Uh, but for now, it's easy. I've only had two tests. This guy's already asked me questions. It's complicated. But let's, uh, let, let's, keep it, let's keep it simple for now. And we will elaborate on it in future courses. All right? Any questions on this so far? This is, this is only a review. All right. So today, we're going to do two cases that involve regulatory takings. Right? which oddly enough, don't really impact either of these. The first case, Penn Colby Mahon, from 1922, I don't know if you noticed this, but the majority opinion does not even cite how to check. Go figure, huh? I'll, I'll get to that more in a minute. But I think how to check was five or six years earlier. It's not even cited. Let's talk about coal for a moment. Uh, I need to explain to you what subsidence is, okay? So simple physics, right? If you dig underneath something, the ground will slowly cave in, right? This is not a, a, a stunningly complicated concept. So uh, th this diagram, which I stole from Wikipedia, um, has some good uh, 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 graphics. So here is a, an example of uh, trying to get some sort of oil or natural gas. So when you start drilling and pumping from the ground, the amount of oil decreases, and then the weight of the earth collapses. So you can see effectively here that the earth caves in. Same thing for limestone. When you start digging, so for mining, when you start digging, you actually the mountain kind of shifts and caves in. This process by which the ground caves in underneath you is called subsidence. Okay. Sub, like underneath, subsidence. This is a very serious problem in mining countries. Anyone ever dealt with this in any respect? 
I usually have one or two people done with this. Okay. This is a very dangerous problem. Um, as you may imagine, if your house is on top of a coal mine and there's subsidence, your house falls into the ground and collapses. Right? Your house falls apart. That's bad. If you have your farm on top of a coal mine and it collapses, then your farm's ruined. And even if, say, you know, your house is, say, here, your house is, like, here, and they're drilling somewhere far away, because of the way the minerals go underneath the earth, the entire lot may collapse. So even if they're drilling at some point far away in a slant, the land underneath your home may collapse and fall in. Okay, so everyone get, get the, the health risk. So that brings us to the case of Penn Colby Meha. This is actually from Scranton. Do you know who's from Scranton? Come on. Who else is from Scranton? Joe Biden. <laughs> Joe Biden is from Scranton. That was a perfect plug. I wasn't planning that one. Yes, he'll tell you that every five seconds. By the way, speaking of Joe Biden Law School, do you know what his class rank was in law school? I think it was third from last. And by the way, his law review note was plagiarized grossly. Uh, he, he should have never passed a bar exam. He grossly plagiarized law review note, and he plagiarized many of his uh, presidential speeches. We remember president in 1988. Uh, so not a not a good example. He also taught classes. I should put taught in quotes at the Widener Law School. But he never actually showed up. He had someone else do it for him. So uh, his law school experiences are aren't so grand. Uh, but I'll I'll give. I prefer the Onion version anyway of Joe Biden. So we have a situation in Pennsylvania, okay, where a deed was executed and it gave a coal company sur subsurface rights. Okay. The coal company had subsurface rights. All right, now where did I finish last time? All right, thank you. All right, later. So when you're the coal company and you're negotiating with the homeowner to buy subsurface rights, what do you think one of the terms you might want to discuss is in light of this discussion on subsidence? Or what's the alternative? What happens if something happens? Could the coal companies have said, we'll cover your losses? But that happened, though. So here's what's interesting. Many of the coal companies that purchased the, 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 uh, the subsurface rights, the mineral rights, said, OK, I tell you what, we'll buy the land underneath your house. And if there's subsidence, right, if there's this cave-in, we'll pay you for it. <laughs> In other words, they actually negotiated for an insurance policy. And if you read some of the notes after the case, you found this is actually fairly common. Uh, the coal companies weren't as rapacious as you might think they are, and they actually had some sense of liability. And they said, okay, we will pay you if there's subsidence, right? But later, did that happen in this case? Did they negotiate anything? Okay. So the Mahans, who are the plaintiffs, uh, sold their subsurface rights to this coal company, to the Penn Coal Company, and then a law was passed, right? The Kohler Act. Uh, 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 Mike, tell me, what is, what is this Kohler Act? It essentially forbid any kind of uh, mining activity that would uh, harm the surface uh, of human, uh, or sorry, human habitation. Very good. Okay, so this Kohler Act was an act passed by the Pennsylvania Assembly, and the law says that you cannot mine in any way to cause subsidence of a home. You cannot do any mining in any way that can cause cave-in. All right. So let's break this down for a second, uh, 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 Zach. Oops, wrong, wrong window. Let's break this down for a second, right? If you purchase subsurface rights anywhere, would this mm -hmm. law prevent you from, from digging? Um, yes, uh, other than there's certain exceptions. Well, where could you dig? Uh, if you would have to own uh, the ground level, and uh, there could be any homes within the group. Okay, good. So, 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 so here's what, here's the thing. You are allowed to dig for coal, but it had to be sufficiently far away from the houses, right? So, think about you know this entire area right under here. Say you bought this entire region. You could only not dig basically underneath the house in the surrounding area, right? So, so Parso, was it 
What was the effect of this law on the property rights of the coal companies? What did it actually eliminate? How much did that value? Okay, but was it all of it? What, 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 what did he just say a second ago? Were they allowed to dig anywhere? Assume they only own the sur surface. Where were they allowed to dig, say, if they only had the subsurface rights? Beyond the houses, right? So one of the tricky things about this case, and this is one of the big disagreements between Justice Holmes and Justice Brandeis in dissent, Justice Holmes thinks that it took all the value, but Justice Brandeis makes a different argument. He says, wait a minute. They're still allowed to dig somewhere else. They can dig away from the house. So one of the issues you have to think about here is what is the exact interest that's being diminished? Are we only talking about the land underneath the house or the parcel as a whole? Okay. Before we get to there, let's focus on this statue for a second, right? Let's assume that Justice Holmes is right, uh, uh, Jordan. Assume that Justice Holmes is right and that all the value is being diminished. We'll come back there later. Then what exactly is this statute doing? What's the operation of the statute? Yes, Kohler Act. Um, one way to look at it is it protects the welfare of people who own the land, therefore they can't be digging under it. Good. Okay, so on the one hand, we can understand this law to being, I think what you're getting as a police power exercise, right? Saying that we want to protect people and prevent their homes from falling into the earth. You know, like, like you know, like, like in, a, in like a horror movie, like the earthquake, right, where the house just falls into the ground, right? Zach, what's another way of looking at the statue, though, from the other angle? What's the effect of the statute? Exactly. This is, in another sense, a regulatory taking, right? How is it a regulatory taking? Because you're putting a limitation on the ability of someone to use their property rights. This company purchased mineral rights to dig for coal in this region. That was their property right, and they owned it in fee simple. There was no question they owned those mineral rights in fee simple. After the statute, they may own the minerals in fee simple, but they can't do anything to it because they can't dig. So basically, the government took their fee simple and nullified it. What the coal company argues is that their property rights were effectively nullified. They were wiped out where they might own it in terms of title, but they have nothing to do with it. They can't do anything with it. So the question in this case, much like the question in how to check, is this an exercise of the police power, or is this a taking that would require the state to provide compensation? Is this something getting rid of a nuisance or something dangerous like the subsidence, which, which I think everyone would agree is it's a pretty bad thing if your house falls into the ground, right? Or is this an instance where someone's property right was nullified and diminished and would require compensation? And by the way, if this in fact is a taking, the statute's void. Why is the statute void? Because it doesn't provide for any compensation, therefore it can't be a valid taking. Okay. All right, so uh, 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 Kelsey, how did the how did how did the court how did Justice Holmes um, approach this issue? We'll do the dissent in a few minutes. But how did Justice Holmes' majority approach this issue? Um, they said that it was a taking. Okay, why why was it a taking? Because I mean, if somebody owns the mineral um, rights to something, they can't use it. They can't use it. They can't use it. Okay, good. All right, so. The majority, and everyone knows about Justice Holmes, just Olive Wendell Holmes, one of the one of the greats. Not one of my favorites, but he's very well respected. Um, he served in the Civil War. He lived to be in his 90s. He had a very distinguished career as a judge in Massachusetts and then at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, but his opinion is very out of character because he makes these very broad statements about the importance of property rights. <clears throat> he makes these very broad statements how this law is not justified as a protection of personal safety. He seems very skeptical, if you will, of the government's stated interests, right? In fact, I don't even think he believes that these coal mines are so dangerous, right? David, what does Holmes say could be done instead of, um, instead of banning mining? What else could be done? How could the state have accomplished this goal differently? 
They could have done that, but what, what, what else? What short of banning mining could the state have done to prevent subsidence? Think about it, even if, it's not, if you didn't get an opinion. What else, what, what can the state do in addition to banning stuff? Blaine, what do you think? If you didn't get in the case, what, what could the state do short of banning mining? Anyone? What? No. They could tax it. <laughs> yeah, like John Roberts. They could tax it. What else? <laughs> warnings, right? Right, warnings. Couldn't they require the coal companies to provide warnings about subsidence? What else? What else could they have done? Yes, liability. It says if there's actually subsidence, then you're required under law to pay for it. Maybe make the coal companies take an insurance waiver that says they'll cover it, right? So Holmes says, listen, there's a lot of different ways that you can protect houses short of diminishing 100% of values. Okay? And then he says that subsidence is not a public nuisance, which is really strange because Justice Holmes is usually very deferential. If you remember his dissent in the case of Lockton versus New York, uh, this was a man who would not second guess anything. He famously said, if my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I shall help them get there. Uh, he was a majoritarian in every sense of the word, and he would uh, uh, generally defer to the majority in everything. He wrote the decision in Buck v. Bell where he said sterilization is fine because three generations imbeciles are enough. Uh, so this was very out of character. I've, I've been, whenever I read this, I rack my brain saying, how is this Holmes? But uh, it's Holmes. So he says, this cannot be sustained as an exercise of the police power, right? Where there's property rights to be had. The protection of private property Right, does not go away because people have these uh, uh, concerns for safety. All right, so now we agree. I think we understand that Justice Holmes thinks that this is not a taking. So one of the most infuriating aspects of Holmes' decisions is that they are not clear on what the actual rule of law is. They have this beautiful flowery prose. I love reading Holmes, but the actual rule is always very nebulous. All right, so Stephen, let's try and figure out what the heck is the test, right? Yeah, you're shaking your head. What is the test that Justice Holmes lays down in 1916 to determine whether this law constitutes a regulatory taking? Let's see if you can get it. <laughs> I, think, I think what he's saying is there's got to be the average reciprocity. reciprocity. If you're going to use, um, if you're going to call it not a taking, you're going to have to say that it's the public good and therefore for his private good and therefore he actually is compensated by the law. That's right. Not what I was looking for, but that, that, that's right. Okay, how does, how does Holmes phrase the test of when something's a taking? What does, what does he say? He says it in one spot. If you can find it, it says the general rule. He actually says that. But it's somewhat nebulous what that means. Uh, I know he said that the property can be regulated only to Good. Good, good, good. You're on, you're on the right track. Danielle, do you, do you have what I'm looking for? Yeah, so the regulation goes to... Yes. 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 My friends, this is the test from Penn Cole. If the regulation goes too far. That's the test. I bless Olive Wendell Holmes, Jr. If the regulation goes too far to taking, what the heck is that? What does it mean for regulation to go too far? How do we know if regulation goes too far? Is there anything in the opinion that tells us when a regulation goes too far? The answer is no, it does not tell us. So it's been up to future courts to try to uh, 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 graft meaning onto this. Okay? So generally speaking, it's, Holmes says, it's kind of a question of degree. So we look at something called diminution in value, which isn't clearly stated in the opinion. It's kind of suggested. But if the value of property is diminished too much, it goes too far, it's a taking. 
if the value of the property is not diminished far enough, doesn't go far enough, it's not a taking. So while many of you were not happy with the bright line rule in the uh, Loretto case in the last class, you like, oh, we should balance this and balance that. This presents the exact opposite problem. It's such an open-ended test <laughs> that there's really nothing in the Supreme Court decision to say how far something must go. So the difference between the clay or the brick thing is that they can still live on top of that land and they didn't go too far to take away the diminution where they can't live on the All right, good. So let's let's compare the brick case and the coal case, right? Um, uh, I'll get your question in a second. So Joseph, in, in the brick case, as, as Hugo said, were they still allowed to live on top of the land? Could they still do something on top of the land? Yes. Okay. Let's assume here, would the coal company still be allowed to own the coal? So what's the difference? The difference is that they can mine it in certain areas and not, and, you know, right? Under no, no, uh, ass assuming Holmes is right, assuming that they can't mine anywhere, which Holmes kind of ignored that fact, right? It's, it's, the, it's the fact that you cannot do your business in either place. The place with the brick case, it was only suited for bricks, right? That's all you could do there. Is this land suitable for anything else other than coal mining? So, so let's say, I, I think you're making a big distinction on the subsurface versus surface rights. Say this wasn't, you know, um, mining. Say it was like, you know, farming on top of the surface, right? And say the state passed was saying no farming near, near houses. Then what? Okay. So at, at this point, you can say all there is to live on there, all right? Now, Tyler, how is this case not controlled by Hadachek? And again, I'll repeat. Majority does not even cite Hadachek this, I think, five or six years earlier. How is this case not controlled by Hadachek? They said this wasn't a nuisance. I know he said that, but why? how is this not a nuisance? Yes, he said it wasn't a nuisance, right? He, he made that point. Uh, I don't think he really explained it. So, so here's the weird thing about this decision, right? Under Hadachek, which, which basically said when the March society moves on, property rights will not stand in the way, right? Remember the Karl Marx tirade. You know, when the, when the opinion has, has, has garbage like that in it, right? The police power is everything. But here, we're not talking about something as, you know, harmless as baking bricks, but I'm talking about like your house collapses into a pit. This is a very, people die this way. This is not a joke, right? House collapses, people get trapped in the mine. This is not a joke, right? We are not, we are not playing with a little brick clay, you know, Play-Doh here, right? How is this not a nuisance? Anyone want to take a stab? Hugo, you want to take a step? Uh, because it's underground. It doesn't directly connect, like, they don't uh, they, Yeah, yeah, Garrett? Because it has a high enough public value for the rest Ooh. of the Ooh, okay, explain more. I think you're on the right track. So something may be a nuisance, but it can be legally overcome if the value of the activity is great enough to society. Okay. I think that's right. I think that's a good answer, right? This is better than what Holmes said. If you were Holmes' law clerk, you could give him a much better explanation. Effectively, they talk about this thing called reciprocity of advantage, right? In Pennsylvania, today, as it was 80 years ago, coal was very important. This was a major source of industry where a lot of people depend on their, li or their livelihoods for, right? Although it was a nuisance, no doubt, and although it harmed people, the general wealth will demanded more. Right, the general welfare demand that this industry remain vibrant. Because to shut down this industry would actually harm more people. But this raises a very important question, uh, uh, Morgan. Very important question. Who's making the decision of what's more important to the welfare of Pennsylvanians? The Pennsylvania Assembly or the Supreme Court in this case? Exactly. The Pennsylvania Assembly, the legislature. In Harrisburg, they said, listen, this is a problem, right? This substance is a problem. We want to pass law to protect our people. Yes, we agree that coal mining is important, but this is more important. And here, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania said, nah, they didn't really mean that. That's not what they really meant. What they really meant was that coal mining is more important, and we're going to protect that first and foremost. That property rights in mining coal outweigh 
whatever benefits re, uh, result from having uh, you know these safety regulations. So again, this is Bizarro Holmes. I still cannot figure out this opinion for the life of me. We're in Lochner. He says, you know, the Fourteenth Amendment does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics, and we do not have this this lazy fair social Darwinism running running amok and these industrialists killing people. And here he says, you know what? The state passed a law protecting the people, but it's a taking. Too bad. I, I, I rack my brain every time I teach this case. I, I don't get it. All right. So everyone get Holmes, right? Everyone more or less know where he stands. He puts out this test, which is not really a test, that says when a regulation goes too far and the diminution of value to taking. Now, I'll give you a little preview. In the cases Judge Busby will teach on Tuesday, the Supreme Court in the 90s tries to clarify this a little bit. But in their attempt to clarify, I think they make it even more complicated, which is often what happens. But they will, Justice Scalia will try to rehabilitate Holmes a bit, uh, but it doesn't turn out too well because Justice Stevens gets the last laugh, as he often did. Okay. All right, let's talk about the dissent. Um, uh, Sumaya, what did, uh, what did Justice Brandeis say, say in the dissent? Good. I'm sorry, what? The values, how the values are going Good. Yeah. Good, good, good. All right, you said a lot of things that are correct. So let's, let's try and walk through them one at a time, okay? So first he says, listen, this has had a check, right? This is a nuisance in the most classic sense. Um, I don't know if you studied substance and nuisance, but actually a common law, if you were to dig underneath someone's property and cause the ground to shift and their house collapses, you could sue for a common law nuisance. I, th I think that's in our book at least. I don't know if you ever studied that. So this was a clear common law nuisance, right? Digging near someone's house to cause structural problems. Beyond just being a nuisance, it's a, it's a, it's a noxious use. It's dangerous. People can die this way, right? If, this, if the state's police power doesn't cover people dying, Right, from falling into the earth or getting trapped in a coal mine, then what the heck does it cover? And Brandeis basically says on the use of property will diminish its value. Right? This test, Brandeis says, is making no sense. Because every single time you use a police power, you diminish someone's property value. And who's to say if the diminution goes too far? The legislature or the court? What this test does is it aggrandizes that decision to the court. The court now gets to decide who's in charge. Okay? But then I think Brandeis makes a much better point, which is based on property law. He says, listen, we have to think not only in terms of the coal. We have to think in terms of the parcel as a whole. And this is an expression which we'll see in this case in the next, right? The parcel as a whole. Say if the land is 100 acres and they're not able to drill on, say, 10 acres, right, because of the house, that still leaves 90 acres to drill on, right? While it's true in those 10 acres that you cannot drill, your property value has dropped to zero. What about in the 90 acres surrounding it? You're good to go. So what Brandeis argues is we shouldn't be so narrow, right? We shouldn't only focus on the area where you can't drill. We should focus on the entire parcel. Or to put this in terms of, of, of the case we're doing uh, um, next, just because they can't build a tower on top of the train station, they still have the train station, right? They still have other value in the land. Now, I think the argument works better here than in Penn Central, but I think Brandeis makes a good point. He also says the mere fact that some restrictions are put on your land doesn't mean that there's a taking. He would just take a very broad understanding of the police power. In other words, this is not eminent domain. Okay. The, uh, the dissent also says, wait a minute, we should be deferring to the state here, right? Who's in a better position to understand safety of mines? Courts or legislatures? And the answer here, Brandeis, surprisingly, the progressive, says the state should decide it. Yeah. All right, so any questions on the dissent? This is a tricky case for a number of reasons, but the most hard of which is that Justice Holmes' test was not very helpful. 
How do we know if a taking goes too far? How do we know if the value has been diminished too much? We, 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 we don't know. And it requires some really bizarre balancing that has to look at, as Garrett mentioned, you know, what is the benefit of this activity, right? What benefit does this activity bring to society? What's the actual cost to human life and safety of your house falling into the, to the earth? Right? These, are, these are hard questions. So while the, the uh, categorical test, right, the categorical test in Loretto is easy to apply, the Penn-Cole test is very tough to apply. Alright. Alright, questions on pen call. Yes. Oh, you're scratching your ear. You know, the Carol Burnett show, at the end of every show, she would tug on her ear to as a signal to say hi to her mom or something. That was like a little trick on TV. If you know who Carol Burnett is. No. Okay. It, it wasn't live when I wasn't live for it either. I just watched a lot of Nick at night. Okay. So everyone get the Penn Coal test, right? Okay. So after you read the Penn Coal test, you say, okay, cool, I've got this new test so that when there's a regulation on property, I'm going to apply Penn Coal. Did any of you ask yourselves, why did Penn Central not simply apply the Penn Coal test? You should have if you were paying attention, right? We just read this entire test about diminishing property values, right? Why wouldn't the port in Penn Central simply apply this test? And the answer is Justice Brennan, okay? <laughs> uh, the short answer is Justice Brennan. Um, the Penn Coal test had proved very difficult to apply. So what the court tried to in Penn Central was figure out a different way of looking at these regulations. So after Penn Central was decided, it looked like Penn Coal was, you know, obsolete. But We'll get to the cases on Tuesday where Justice Scalia brings Penn Coal back. So we exist in a world today where we have both Penn Coal and Penn Central. And you won't fully understand this until Tuesday. So take my word for it. Don't forget about Penn Coal for now. We will come back to it. Let's try to study Penn Central in, in you know, a little bit of a vacuum where we're not focusing on Penn Coal. Good? Everyone, everyone with me so far? All right, so uh, uh, Atai, tell me, what, what were the facts in Penn Central versus uh, City of New York? Okay, so in Penn Central, um, there's the kind of famous subway terminal in New York City. Um, wait, wait, I'll stop you. Has anyone ever, ever been to the Grand Central Station? Okay, it's a beautiful train station. Uh, um, uh, he, here, here's a photograph of the inside. Um, this I took this one myself, so it's not very good. Um, I actually, it's actually funny. I actually use a photograph on some website that I found, and someone sent me like a cease and desist order to take it down, so I took my own. But on the inside, there are these beautiful stencil gold constellations of the sky. It's it's really remarkable to look at. Um, the issue, and again, I guess I'm even from New York, but the Penn Central Station. I'll give you a map to show you the perspective. Oh, this is a famous picture, so I'm sure you've seen before. Uh, buh, 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 buh. This one. I'm sure many of you have seen this photograph before, but it's a beautiful train station. So the Penn Central train station is located on Park Avenue. Okay, Park Avenue is one of the most exclusive areas um, uh, in, in Manhattan. This is where, like, you know, the really, 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 really wealthy people live. So this is a layout of Park Avenue. Okay. There you have the Empire State Building. There you have the Chrysler Building. Uh, I think this is 30 Rock, I'm not sure. Um, and this is what was then the Pan Am Building, and this is the MetLife Building. I'm sorry, this is the train station, the Grand Central Station. This train station is beautiful, and a lot of people wanted to preserve it. And one of the reasons they were so eager to preserve it was that until recently, there was a view from straight down Park Avenue all the way to where the Empire State Building is. A couple of years where this case emerged, this building went up. It's today called the uh, MetLife Building. And you can see it. So basically dwarfing this train station is this huge tower. It used to be called the Pan Am Building. Pan Am, Pan American. It was a huge airline owned by Juan Tripp, among others. 
Uh, if, you saw, if you saw the aviator with, with the Nicholas, uh, you know, DiCaprio, you've seen a lot about it. So effectively what happened was you had this beautiful train station. And I, I actually I took this photograph with, uh, with risk, of, risk of life for them. I was actually saying in the street to take this one. Uh, not quite bad. And you can see it's basically just sitting right in front of this huge tower. OK? So all right, Ty, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted people to understand the context first. OK, so the people that own the terminal, they want to build some office space above it. Um, and, a, and a couple years before, it's been declared a landmark, so there's some stuff that we go through since it is a landmark. Mm -hmm. uh, they draw up two plans. Uh, they originally get shot down. So then they apply for a certificate of appropriateness, and uh, that gets shot down. And so they take it to the courts, and uh, they have some options with the certificate of appropriateness, and um, like to redraft the designs and things like that. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that; they just took it to the courts. Okay. Okay. So here's the deal: building in New York City is virtually impossible. For the reasons we discussed last week why building in Houston is so easy, building in New York is not. Because in order to build anything, you need to go through so many boards and layers of approval. So at some point, the city of New York designated this train station as a historical site. And as a historical site, they're basically required to keep the exterior in what's called good repair, which means you can't change it. The commission has to approve in advance any changes to the exterior. And those decisions must be made not only with respect to the public interest, but also the landowner's use of the property. I will tell you, my friends, that the commission that makes the decisions doesn't give a damn about the business of the train station. They couldn't care less. I'm not saying this to be cynical, but their concern is not for the well-being of the business. Their concern is to make things look pretty and so they have nice use for Park Avenue. So in order to actually request a change to actually modify it, to put a tower on top of the, of the building, you need to apply for a certificate of no effect on the features. Okay, that's going to be denied because you are having an effect on the features, you're changing it. You can apply for a certificate of appropriateness, right? That's saying, look, this is going to be aesthetically pleasing. If you think back to our discussion of the UFO house, where these busybodies just deny anything that looks different, you know that this will not be granted. They also say we want a certificate of appropriateness because we're not going to get enough money. Again, they don't give a damn about the money. In New York City, you are merely a cog in someone else's picture, and businesses come, come last. Yep. So they do try and give some bone. So in New York City, there's something called uh, economic development rights. Okay. What does this mean? Well, you might not be able to build a tower on this block, but we'll let you build a tower the same size somewhere else. This is how building in New York works. They say, you can't build something here, but if you buy property somewhere else, you can build it there. You can transfer your development rights. I used to assign a case that explored those, but I stopped assigning it because it was more complicated than it's worth. But this is a very, very speculative issue because it requires you to actually own enough land somewhere else that you can build the exact same tower and jump through all the hoops there. Okay. The court doesn't address whether these transfer development rights are actually uh, just compensation, but they don't really need to. Okay. So this is, this is Grand Central Station, and they had two proposals of how to build it. So the first one, Brewer 1, effectively keeps the bottom as it is and installs this massive tower on top, and you can, you can see it there. So you have this nice, you know, nice train station there with this thing on top. The second one, Brewer 2, uh, effectively destroys the train station and uh, uh, builds it from scratch. Oh, I scrolled down too far. Okay. Destroys the train station and builds it from scratch. As you might imagine, the city which had just designated this historical preservation site de de uh, declined both of these designs. Okay. The uh, appellant applied for some sort of uh, certificate of appropriateness. It was denied. Now, uh, Jane, did they seek any uh, judicial review of the denial? So they went to trial court, and they were granted injunctive relief. And then um, the 
Yes, but did they actually try to appeal through the various boards and agencies the denial of the of these two building permit of these two designs? Well, the commission and of itself that the two buildings were like an aesthetic. Did they appeal that judgment? They. Um, no, they didn't. Went to the trial. And what did they ask the trial court to do? They asked for injunctive Based on what? What was their? What was their constitutional claim? Their constitutional claim was the fact that. The fact that they're building on top of the railroad station, it wasn't, it was the idea of the fact that they're getting a, um, the primary, the primary point of building them there was that it wasn't affecting the railroad station of itself, so that they had property rights. What, what constitutional clause were they citing? What was, what were they objecting to? You're exactly right. The takings clause, the taking clause right? They said this is a taking. That's a designation. Of the train station as a uh, site, historical site, constituted taking. And that was unconstitutional taking without compensation. They said, listen, we could make millions of dollars off of this tower. Millions. Someone would line up right at sign leads to do it, right? And you're not letting us do this. You are diminishing our property values. So this is a taking. And the trial court. Grant an injunction, finding yes, this was a taking. It was appealed up to the uh, New York court system, okay, and it was reversed. The New York Intermediate Court says this was not a taking, and they didn't lose all the value of their property. They might have lost some value, but they weren't losing all their value. And it's like, hey, you can still keep the train station running. The trains will run on time, but you just can't build the tower. Um, I don't think there's much of a consolation because the train station could have made a lot more money, right? V, at the time, were they making any money from this tall tower? Could they have been making any money from this tall tower? It's a trick question. Could they have made money from something they haven't built yet? Of course not. So here's the idiocy of this case. And I, I don't mean to be glib, but it, it, there's a huge logical failing of this case. They said, they were not making any money. They had no investments from this tall tower, right? They were not allowed to build the tall tower. The reason why they had no investments in this tower or profit from it was because they, they could not build it. How can they possibly invest in something that they can't build, right? This is the serious failing of Brennan's opinion that drives me nuts every time I teach it, right? The entire reason why the low court said that they weren't really losing anything was because they hadn't done anything yet. But the reason why they can't do anything yet is because the law wouldn't allow them to. It's this weird, hellish catch-22 that is being a developer in New York. All right? So, uh, uh, Brittany, how did the Supreme Court then uh, handle this case and appeal? What? It's, it's a very long opinion. It's winding. But try to give me an overview of what, what, how they resolved it. Um. Well, let's start, start easy. Did the court find that this was taking for the, for the majority? No. Do you have it? No. No, just tell me. If you don't have it, tell me. It's easier. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So, Nassim, let's, let's, let's try this one, okay? Did, did the court consider whether this case was controlled as a nuisance? In other words, let's think of our let's think of our test, right? Was this a case where they were trying to stop a nuisance? Was this tall tower a nuisance? Uh, no. Okay, why is it not a nuisance? I think uh, it, it was the uh, zoning ordinance. Exactly. Right. So this building was not a nuisance, right? It wasn't going to block any sun. Wasn't going to make noise. Whatever else, it met all the conditions. Okay. Uh, let's try our other tests. Um, uh, Lee, was there any claim that there was some sort of a uh, uh, permanent physical occupation that the government was trying to impose. Were they telling them you had to install cables or wires onto the train station? Was there any, any kind of permanent taking involved? Here. I don't think so. No. Good. So, okay. So, these up to date, you know, these, these are our taking steps, right? There's really no nuisance. There's not really any kind of physical taking, right? Daniel, what, what does that leave us with? Which, which test should have resolved this case? Uh, Penn Cole, right. Under Penn Coal, do you think this regulation goes too far in diminishing value? The, the people that want to 
put something there. I think so. Okay, and this is this is the question that Justice uh, Brennan would rather not answer, right? If we apply this, as Holmes said, right, we're talking here not about surface rights but air rights. Remember, you have the ad coelum; you have all the land underneath your ground into the sky, right? Re uh, other Daniel, what percentage of their air rights were being deprived of value? Uh, Eighty-seven and a half percent, seventy-five percent. More or less 100%, right? They're air rights, right? Could they build anything in the air? Uh, only if they transfer it. There, there. Oh, no. Okay, so here's the deal. 100% of their air rights were diminished. Now, there was something in the case where Brennan makes up, like, oh, maybe if they came back and they tried building something a little bit shorter, it would have been approved. No. That's just stupid. This, this is Brennan at his worst. They were not going to approve anything. They were going to keep it exactly the way it was. Okay. So 100% of their air rights, basically all of this was diminished. So under Penn Cole Daniel, would this be a take under the majority opinion by Holmes? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, let's, let's go on to um, uh, uh, Heath, right? Under Justice Brandeis' dissent, right, he said, we have to consider the parcel as a whole. We have to consider the parcel as a whole, right? So instead of just looking at the uh, uh, air rights by themselves, we can look at the entire property, including the train station. Did the train station business continue? Yes. Okay. So how much of the value of the property was diminished under the descent by not allowing this, this, this tower to be built? None of it? The current value? Yes. Well, oh, no, no, no. What's the value of the land in light of what people want to build on it? And they were still not enough to them from making money for the work. Are, if you say you can't build on top, is that diminishing the future value of the land? Why is the answer? That's correct. Why is the answer yes? Because it's going to be worth more. Yes. So under the dissent, at least I would argue, Justice Brett's dissent, transitions don't make much money. Right? You know, trains aren't a big source of profit. In case you couldn't tell, Amtrak has been bankrupt for like the last 30 years, okay? The big money, we're putting a huge tower in Midtown Manhattan right above the transit center. So even under the descent of looking at the parcel as a whole, right, as a parcel as a whole, I'd argue that there's a significant diminution of value. I think this would go too far. So I think even under the Penn Central majority, or the Penn Central dissent, I'm sorry, I, get the, I got my pens mixed up. Even under the Penn Coal majority or the Penn Coal dissent, I think, I think the train station wins here. But that's not what Justice Brennan does. And he's not very clear why he doesn't do that. But he tries to look at different factors as to how to consider this a taking, right? Lamar, what are, what are some of these factors that he looks at? Okay. And, like, whether or not, like, the character of the government. Go back, flesh out economic impact. What does that mean? Um, I guess what, what does he say? I'm looking for your rights. Does he diminish the property value? No. And it's, that's not the test. You're right about economic impact. Brooke, do you have it? Good, 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 good. So here is, here is the phrase that you need to remember. Distinctive... Investment Act Expectations. Or if you want to be cool, Dibbies. That's what the cool kids call them. Dibbies. Holmes moves Holmes. Brennan moves away from the diminution and value test. He basically ignores it. He's a Supreme Court, he can do whatever you want. It's Brennan being Brennan, right? They move away from the diminution and value test. And they say, listen. Have there been expectations that you'll make more money, right? Does the train station think they'll expect to make more money with this tower? And the answer to that question is yes, right? They expect they can make more money with this tower. But it's not enough to have these expectations, these great expectations, in the words of a, a, a Dickens, right? You need to put your money where your mouth is. 
These expectations need to be backed by investments. In other words, you need to put money behind your expectations. It's not enough to tell the court, hey, I think I'm going to make all these millions of dollars by building this tower. You need to prove it. You need to actually invest distinctly in those expectations. This is the key factor of Penn Central. Unless you show that you've invested money to back up those expectations in a concrete way, you're going to lose. So it's not enough that your value of property has been diminished. That's not enough anymore. Now, your value of property must has been diminished and there's money behind it. Everyone see that? So, uh, uh, Brooke, let me ask you this question. Did the, the train station invest any money with the expectations that they would uh, build this tower and make all this you know, revenue? Good. They planned. They drew these pictures, right? Brooke, do you think that's enough into Brennan's test? Okay. Now, Stephanie, let me ask you a follow-up question. What money could they have invested in light of the fact they weren't allowed to do anything? Nothing. This is the catch-22 of Penn Central. You need to invest money in order to win the takings claim, but you can't invest money until you're allowed to build something, and you can't build anything because the government will it, you lose. I mean, there are very few, there are numbers in this. There are very few Penn Central claims where someone actually wins. Did it pay out yet? Of of Did it pay yet? No. So that's, <laughs> this is why the Brennan test, this is why these dibbies are ridiculous, right? And I, I usually I'm pretty nuanced in this topic, I get very upset, so I apologize in advance for my lack of biasness, uh, lack of, lack, lack of uh, credit neutrality on this one. But basically, he's, Brendan is setting up property owners, saying, listen, in order to save yourself from regulatory takings claim, you need to invest money. But you can't invest money if the state won't let you. So uh, you lose. It's like heads I, heads I win, tails you lose, one of those deals, right? Um, the, the entire opinion just walks through about why this importance of having these uh, distinctive investment back expectations. Okay. Uh, there are other factors which aren't nearly as important. So, so Lamar said, and I cut him off, it also looks at the character of the governmental action, which I suppose in this case is somewhat redeeming because they're trying to preserve historical sites, which is a fairly you know, I guess that, that's nice and fits under the police power. Um, and they also look at whether it was a physical invasion uh, or something that adjusts the benefits and burdens of economic life. This is, this is getting at the reciprocity advantage discussion we had before. In other words, if people are made better off by this, then it's okay. If all these neighbors can veto the construction of this tower, no problem. You know, that, that's fine. Okay? This is clearly within the police power. All right, so any questions so far? So the main thing you need to know about Penn, uh, Penn Central is this Dibby. And in virtually every single case where Penn Central is the appropriate test, you have to see, has the person invested money? Okay. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, Mariah. Go back to the coal case for a minute. Were there dibbies in the coal case? What were, what, what, what were the uh, investments in the coal case? Yeah, they pay for mineral rights, and they were mining there. So back in the olden days, it was more possible because they were having all these mining and stuff, but the law was passed afterwards. Here, where the law is passed before you sign the contract, there are no investments that can be made. Right? This is the, this is the Penn Central trap that, 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 that basically leaves property owners um, uh, without much of a remedy. 
So this, this case renders it virtually impossible under the Penn Central case for people to win. Unless you can show that you invested some money before the issue began, you're going to be in really tough luck. But in a place like New York, where before you built anything, you know, through all these boards and hoops and other things, it's virtually impossible for you to do so. Um, Brennan also does something very crafty, where he discusses the parcel as a whole. And he says, listen, when we say parcel as a whole, we're not just talking about the one building here. The train station is owned by a company that a lot of sites throughout Manhattan. It's like, look, you own some property there, property there, property there. Your restriction is only in this one. So look, of all the property you own, all we're talking about the air rights above one tower. Uh, th this is sophistry at its worst. Um, uh, effectively, he's saying, well, because you're so rich, you can build it somewhere else, uh, which if we believe you know, each plot of land is unique, as been taught since the first day of property class, I want to build here. I want to build a tower there. If I want to build a tower somewhere else, I would have done that. But this, again, is allowing the state to second-guess decisions of property owners. So if you want to see actually where the opinion sums up, on 1122, he finally summarizes the opinion. Uh, and he says that, you know, we can't divide parcels into these discrete segments. We need to look at the entirety of everything this person owns. And when we do that, we realize things ain't that bad. You look at the entire city and not just this one lot. Okay? All right. So questions on this? Questions on this case? Yeah. I think you said that. Yes. So, 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 in the same way that Village of Euclid was one of the first cases that tested zoning laws, this was one of the first cases that tested historical sites. So, we're not preserving things for, for residential usage. We want people living there or here. Here we're keeping things the same for the sake of keeping them the same. And this was a very serious deprivation of value, right? I know all of you love old historical sites, uh, uh, but to have this real estate in Midtown Mid Manhattan would, would be worth billions today. I couldn't even put a number on it. It'd be in the, it maybe even trillions, I don't even know. You know, the new World Trade Center tower was like, worth like trillion dollars, two trillion dollars, I don't even know. Um, so basically they're saying, yeah, having something kept the same because it's pretty, that's sufficient to deprive the owner of millions and billions of dollars. This is life in Manhattan, right? This is like saying, okay, you can't build here, but you can build somewhere else. Of course. What, the only caveat is they don't have to jump through so many hoops. Basically, it speeds up the process of building somewhere else. It's not much of a consolation prize. This is like, don't piss on me and tell me it's raining, right? If I want to build there, I would build there. Uh, but, but, this is, but this is development in New York. These transfer development credits are very, uh, uh, are very often used so that people can build somewhere else. And almost presumes that they, you know, the state decides where your business should be, not you. Uh, that, that's the primacy of the state. What I was trying to understand is that they, if the state decides that they want to make it a landmark, and they can build there, and try to contest it, but pretty much they're still going to make it a landmark. And then you have an affirmative duty to oh yes 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 so so you're you're, you're exactly right you not only are, are not allowed to change your facility you have an affirmative duty to keep it exactly the same and that's a significant cost right who pays for that you do right so this is why a lot of people if their property is designated historical site their value goes down to zero right they can't do anything that they can never change it they can't really sell it because they sell it, no one will want it. So these are significant diminutions in value. Even though the regulation in the coal case was only over you know, 150 feet around the house, this takes a massive building in the middle of Manhattan and says you can't change it ever. Too bad. And what's different, this is mentioned in the case, is that they're not talking, right? They're not talking about historical neighborhoods, right? You might have like, you know, historical neighborhood, whatever. These are specific buildings. That are, that are singled out. And we remember we discussed spot zoning, right? Where you just say, oh yeah, that one location gets special treatment. That's what's happening here. It's, they focus on very specific places. Um, now this actually happened 
uh, a couple of years ago. Some of you might remember a ground zero mosque that was proposed, where a group wanted to build a mosque a couple blocks from the World Trade Center site. And all the people started freaking out, saying, oh, no, we can't have this, we can't have this. So one group tried to designate the building where it was supposed to go up as a historical site. It was a factory. I think it was like, it was like a Burlington Coat Factory, something stupid, right? They said, oh, it has these Italian tiles that are very special. This deserves to be a historical site. And for once, New York said, no, we won't make that historical site. They actually got it once right. Uh, they did not designate it as a historical site. But this is very often used as a tool to stop construction. Um, the flip side to this is if anyone knows about Madison Square Garden, I went to Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena. Underneath MSG is the Penn Central, a uh, 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 Penn Station, different train station. And it's very ugly. It's underground. Okay. Recently, get ready for this. So this we're talking about Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena. The city said we are not going to renew your lease for the for the garden. So we want to build a train station there instead. Basically, they did not renew this multi-hundred million dollar stadium's lease so that they can build a train station instead. New York. New York, New York. Hell of a town. OK? All right, so questions in the majority. The dissent by Justice Rehnquist, uh, joined by Chief Justice Berger and Justice Stevens, who was still kind of on the right at that point, I suppose, said that this is ridiculous, right? You are taking away all the value of this person's property. And this is clearly a taking. This is not a nuisance. The, the building fits all the zoning codes. And you're taking the value of one piece of land and not an entire neighborhood. And these, these transfer credits are not just compensation. Right? So effectively, I, I summarize it here. But the Penn Central test focuses on regulatory takings. Okay? And for now, We'll change this when we get to Tuesday. But for now, after Penn Central's decided, Penn Coal effectively became a dead letter. No one cited it. it. Scalia brought it back. But for now, all we have is Penn Central. And the key factor are these distinct investment back expectations, these dibbies. And, and again, if Penn Central applies, so wait, dibbies. So let's try to recap a little bit, and then we'll, we'll finish up. Loretto, right? If there's a permanent physical occupation, there's no balancing. This is a per se categorical taking. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Okay? Had a check, right? This is one use of police power to go after nuisances. There's no taking. There's no compensation. We have Penn Coal. It says if a regulation goes too far, there's too much d uh, diminution in value, right? It's a taking. There is a lot of balancing going on there. We don't really know how it works, but the balance is somewhere that if the regulation's too much, the government loses. And then we come down to Penn Central, where the main factor is <laughs> the, uh, the dibbies, right? Have you invested money in your expectations of what you can achieve? If the answer is no, you lose. And if you somehow manage to actually invest money in advance, you have a shot at winning. So after Penn Central, this was the only test we had, but we will elaborate and talk about more <laughs> Excuse me. More tests on uh, on Tuesday with Judge Busby. Okay. Any questions? Have a great weekend. We'll see you later.